This is the standard level video for D4.3 on climate change. The greenhouse effect is often associated with climate change, so let's just make sure we understand that first. Surrounding Earth, we have an atmosphere and there are greenhouse gases in this atmosphere. And those greenhouse gases are really great because shortwave radiation from the sun, solar radiation, can pass through them. But when that radiation is absorbed and then re-emitted as heat, a lot of that heat is then trapped by the greenhouse gases and then re-emitted back to Earth. And that is what helps moderate Earth's climate. It keeps the Earth warm during nighttime and things like that. Now, some of this is still able to escape, so we've got just the right amount being reflected back to Earth to keep us within a narrow temperature range. The enhanced greenhouse effect comes from the thickening or increase of these greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere. So when we add more things like carbon dioxide to this layer of atmosphere, it decreases how much of that heat is being um, sent back into space and increases the amount being reflected back to Earth. So the normal greenhouse effect, that's great, okay? The enhanced greenhouse effect is bad. That is what is driving climate change. And when we think about this word anthropogenic, what that really relates to is humans. So this is climate change caused by humans. One of the reasons why that decreases the stability of the ecosystems on Earth is because instead of um, uh, operating under negative feedback loops, positive feedback cycles are involved in things like global warming um, due to the enhanced greenhouse effect. So when we have less snow and ice, that means we're going to have less sunlight reflected. And that means we're going to have more radiation from the sun absorbed, which means we will have more ice melting, which now means I have even less snow and ice, less sunlight reflection, so on and so forth. The same thing happens with heat. The more heat I have, the more permafrost melting will occur, and that means more decay, which means more methane produced, which means even more heat trapped and more melting, more decay, more methane. So these are runaway feedback loops, these positive feedback cycles. To continue on with our examples, warmer oceans are going to result in less dissolved carbon dioxide. Increasing the temperature of a liquid actually decreases solubility of gases, which means that you'll have a greater concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the retention of even more heat, which means even more warmer oceans and so on and so forth. Warmer temperatures cause an increase in droughts, which causes an increase in fire, which releases carbon, which again enhances the greenhouse effect and leads to warmer temperatures, more drought, more fires, more carbon release. So these kinds of changes actually destabilize ecosystems um, past this tipping point where it's very hard to return to those stable versions of that ecosystem. Things like forests are normally carbon sinks, and that means that they are storing carbon. They are removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing it in their biomass. When we have things like droughts and heat and fire, that carbon sink then transforms into a carbon source. Burning of these trees will actually release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. So instead of causing the carbon dioxide levels to go down, it's actually increasing the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And so this is a huge shift, right? And so when we get to these points called tipping points, it's often that point where it's really difficult to recover from because you then get into that positive feedback loop. And it's not just plants that are affected, right? So when we talk about climate change, I think one of the more visible examples comes from polar climates, right? So when they get warm, that ice is going to melt. And that can be really important for the organisms that live there, such as these emperor penguins. They use what's called this fast ice, okay, land fast ice is ice that's stuck to the land. Um, and they're using this as a breeding ground. 
The distance between the ice and the sea is very important, so you don't want to have to walk if you're a penguin too far inland. However, if that ice breaks off and it breaks off earlier than anticipated, it can kill the chicks, so this impedes their ability to reproduce. Walruses use sea ice, these free-floating pieces of ice, um, and they use them a lot for resting. So a lack of ice is going to require the walruses to expend a lot of energy finding ice, and that is obviously going to require more feeding um, and some other things that will be very difficult for this um, population to sustain itself. Ocean currents and nutrient upwelling are also affected by climate change. Now, when we say nutrient upwelling, what's supposed to happen is that um, cool water full of nutrients here on the bottom due to cur ocean currents pushes up against big land masses and that cold nutrients den nutrient dense water is pushed towards the surface. And so we call that nutrient upwelling and it's very important um, for getting the nutrients to all different points of this marine ecosystem. Now, when we have warmer surface water, that tends to stabilize these layers of water in the ocean. So if I already have warm water up at the top and cool water down at the bottom, that's not going to encourage mixing. Okay, we need the cool water to be at the top and then sink and then create this continual cycle. So these stable layers um, are really bad because they lead to less upwelling of nutrients and altered timing. So many organisms will time their migration and feeding cycles to go along with when these currents would produce more nutrient availability at different depths. So this decreases nutrient cycling, um, it decreases primary production, and it decreases energy flow. So these small, what seems like a small change just in the surface temperature can have lots of effects um, in that marine ecosystem. Climate change can also affect the ranges um, of where things like animals and plants can live. So we'll talk about upslope range shifts first. This refers to species that live on mountains. So let's say here's my mountain, and I have a species like this crested satin bird that only lives at the top of this mountain or near the top, I'll just do it in red, and it's really good at exploiting that niche because no other species of birds can inhabit that area. So all of the other species of birds, and we'll put them here in green, generally inhabit these lower um, ranges on the slope, and those are the niches that they exploit. As climate change progresses, okay, and things get warmer and warmer and warmer, these downslope species are now able to live in the same habitats as things like the crested satin bird because it's now warm enough up here for these organisms to survive. And so as these species move up the slope to find um, optimal temperatures, they're gonna be competing for niches with organisms that are already up at the top. And it may be that these are able to outcompete um, the ones like the crested satin bird that are already adapted for living at the top and then you'll see a very big shift, um, not only in the range, but in the populations here. So again, as climate change is progressing and global temperatures are going up, not only can organisms live further up in altitude, but they can also um, progress towards the poles. So ordinarily, it would have been too cold for some of these North American tree species to go like past here, let's say. So let's say that was the northern range of a certain species of tree, and prior to these increases in temperature, it was able to inhabit these areas. Well, now that the areas that are closer towards the poles have become warmer, what we're seeing is a shift in the ranges to also include these areas as well. So things like death, okay, in places that are too hot, or again, competition from other species that are also moving poleward are driving this shift. And we're seeing, again, a shift in range either to upslope, that means like up in altitude, or towards the 
the polls and we're going to have a lot uh, different competition um, for things like soil nutrient availability or if we're talking like predator prey relationships. So there's a lot going on here um, with climate change. One of the other ecosystems highly impacted by climate change are coral reefs. And it is important to understand that coral reefs aren't just made of corals, they are entire ecosystems. So they include lots of different organisms, plus all of the abiotic factors there. Now, carbon dioxide absorption um, causes water to become acidic. So the more carbon dioxide that's present in the atmosphere, the more will absorb into the oceans. And acidification means that we're driving down the pH. That change in the pH makes it more difficult for corals to absorb the carbon dioxide from the water. So now there's more carbon dioxide in the water and the corals are even less able to remove it. You can see how this would be a positive feedback cycle. Now that's gonna have a couple of effects on these corals. First of all, their carbon shells, so corals and other marine organisms make their shells out of calcium carbonate, um, can dissolve in those really acidic conditions. So that's going to be dangerous for them as an individual organism, but also remember that corals have a mutualistic relationship with algae. That change in pH and combined with the increased temperature of the water can cause what we call coral bleaching. So this is again, primarily driven by that warmer water, but that coral will actually expel the algae that is um, living with it in a mutually re um, beneficial relationship. And then both the coral and the algae die. And again, it's not just about the coral or just about the algae, these organisms support that entire coral reef ecosystem. So it leads to a complete ecosystem collapse. Now we've talked about various effects of climate change, but really if we trace back those causes, they're all related to the increased carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And so we wanna look for approaches to what we call carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration is capturing and storing carbon. So you're aiming to create a carbon sink, something that holds the carbon, like a carbon bank, if you wanna think about it that way. There are a few processes that sequester that carbon. So things like photosynthesis, okay, and plant growth, they're going to take that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use it to create things like carbohydrates that they can then grow, um, use for growth, and then those carbohydrates and that carbon are stored within that plant body. Marine organisms can use the carbon dioxide to build shells, so that is stored in the shells of those animals. And things like fossilization, like formation of coal, uh, coal oil and natural gas, and the formation of peat, that is also going to store carbon. So when dead things don't fully decay over long periods of time, they can become fossil fuels or peat, and that is a big, huge carbon sink. And so we want to promote these processes if we're going to remove some of that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. One of the approaches to doing that is called afforestation. Afforestation is planting trees in areas with no trees. And it could be no trees maybe because the ecological succession hasn't progressed that far um, or something of the sort, or they're rewilding, something like that. So planting trees in areas with no trees. Now, forest regeneration or reforesting is a special type of afforestation. This is planting trees that have been cut down. So if I have a uh, forest here that's intended for lumber and I cut them all down, I would wanna replant trees here and that's called forest regeneration. Now, usually these trees that are used for afforestation or forest regeneration are fast growing species. And unfortunately, many of these fast growing species are not um, native species. They don't occur there naturally. These approaches also tend to include a monoculture. So instead of planting all of the different variety of trees, they use one or two variety of trees. So we don't have a lot of species diversity. 
in terms of carbon sequestration, this is great, okay? So we can have fast growing species and we're planting lots of trees and we're absorbing lots of carbon. So it positively affects the carbon dioxide levels, but we have to balance that approach um, in thinking about the negative impacts that that might have on ecosystem stability and the other organisms that inhabit that area. Now we mentioned peat a moment ago. Let's just formalize that definition. Peat is partially decomposed organic matter that gets trapped under acidic waterlogged soil. And so it ends up being in an anoxic environment, which prevents any decomposition from taking place or any further decomposition. So because that material can't decompose anymore, all of the carbon compounds in those dead plants and animals are then sequestered. It's a form of carbon sequestration. This can actually happen quite quickly in tropical environments, but we must have acidic and waterlogged soil to create that anoxic environment. Many wetlands have been drained for agriculture. So if we restore those wetlands, okay, and we allow that water to come back in and we reintroduce native species, this can help reestablish this area as a carbon sink by allowing peat to form again, right? And so when we think about theme D, continuity and change, yes, there are cycles in the earth, okay? Yes, things constantly change, but in order to provide continuity over large periods or long periods of time, we really need to think about sustainable ways for reducing the impacts of climate change that are driven by anthropogenic causes and the increase of carbon dioxide levels.